So, so Marm uh, is a local boy. Uh, he actually lived in Watsonville and went to Mount Madonna High School, where I had the uh, an, on a, occasion to talk to one of his high school teachers some years ago, who who uh, who, who reflected on Marm's energy at the time, which didn't surprise me a bit because any of you know who know him know how much incredible energy he has. Um, he went to, to uh, uh, high school locally, and then he went off to UCLA and earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, uh, started out in the engineering field, and then went on to, to MIT and did a master's degree in mechanical engineering. And from there, he went to the University of Wisconsin and uh, did his doctorate in ecology and uh, in ecology and evolutionary biology. And from Wisconsin, uh, I think I have the timing of all this right, he went on to New York for a, sort of a postdoc uh, for a few years with the Consortium for Conservation Medicine in Manhattan. He still maintains an association with them. And then he, uh, he came to UC Santa Cruz as a new faculty member, uh, started as an assistant professor and has worked his way up through and been, been here and is one of the senior faculty here now at UC Santa Cruz. He teaches courses in his, his skills in quantitative ecology, as you might imagine, because of his background in mathematics and engineering. And he also teaches the disease ecology course and is just very active in the department and departmental activities. Uh, he's principally interested in disease ecology. That's what he works on. Uh, and he's been involved with a number of different particular diseases, including uh, West Nile virus. Uh, he's worked on avian influenza. Uh, he's worked on Lyme disease. He's worked on avian malaria in Hawaii. Uh, and he's worked on chytrid disease in, in amphibians and Lyme disease. So he's worked on diseases that involve both wildlife and people and has been very interested sort of the conservation and application dimension to, to disease ecology. So I'm, uh, he, he's probably now one of the world's experts on COVID-19 just because of his hands-on involvement and interest in it. So we're really fortunate to have him here today. And, and what could be more topical and timely than having someone bring us up to speed on, on some of the issues that, that uh, relate to COVID-19. So I'm, I'm really delighted to have him here. And I'll go ahead and turn this turn the screen share over to you, Marm, and you can take it away, okay? It's all yours. I have no control anymore. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Jim. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, Marm, uh, since you are the host, uh, you should probably uh, mute everybody. Okay, let's see if I can do that. I'll include you. All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Jim. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, so I wanna get started by just uh, saying <clears throat> that uh, if you guys have questions afterwards that you wanted to ask me, um, or uh, so I put my email up here on this slide and it's also on the very last slide in case that's of use. Um, I think I'll probably uh, maybe make these slides available or something, Jim, so that if people wanted to see them afterwards, that would be, um, might, they can look at things a second time. Um, and then if people uh, are into social media and want to follow things, um, uh, one of the main ways that scientists are sharing science about uh, COVID-19 these days um, is on uh, Twitter. And the reason for that is that um, a huge amount of science right now is happening so fast and things are changing so quickly that if we just wait for the normal kind of publication processes, things take months or sometimes even a year or two that way and it's just too slow. So, um, so I uh, try to stay up on the science and try to share science that's I think impactful and meaningful and, and, and valid um, on Twitter. And so if people are interested in trying to uh, engage with that media, that's a possibility also. <clears throat> okay, so today I wanted to lay out <clears throat> some goals for today. And so what I'm gonna try to cover today are to really um, see if I can uh, convey four key concepts in disease ecology using COVID-19 as an example. And so the first um, kind of set of topics is the population biology or the population growth of pathogens both inside and between hosts. Um, and in that, we'll try to understand how disease ecologists actually quantify the speed of spread. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, the incubation period and the infectious period and details about that that really matter a lot. Um, 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the variability among individuals in actually spreading uh, this virus and what, what I'll call super spreading events. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about the fact that this virus, like many other pathogens, um, is actually a multi-host pathogen and infects more than one species um, and some characteristics that we've seen about that and what that implies for where the next uh, disease might emerge from. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the seasonality of COVID-19 and the seasonality of diseases in general and some of the factors that we think um, drive seasonality. Um, and then the kind of fourth big, <clears throat> excuse me, major concept um, is going to be about the evolution of pathogens in general, but of course also specifically for COVID-19. Um, and so I'm going to focus on three areas, evolution of pathogens to change their infectiousness, to change how deadly they are, and to evolve uh, to escape the immune system of the hosts. Um, and then uh, on the in the course of uh, looking at these kind of major four concepts, um, I'll also cover some specific, specific information about COVID-19, including the origin of the virus that causes this disease, um, a little bit of details on exactly how it's transmitted, um, some kind of hard quantitative data on actually exactly how deadly it is, measured in the kind of a rigorous ra way rather than some of the ways that you might have seen in the press. Um, and then I'll have a few slides at the end on um, vaccines in general, and then the vaccines uh, that are actually that have been licensed for use in the US, I should say that have been given emergency use authorization in the US, uh, some stuff about how they work, their efficacy and their safety and how that interacts with viral evolution. And then I hope that will leave us a bunch of time for questions and answers at the end. So, so that's the, the, uh, the agenda for today and, and hopefully um, that will address some people's questions that they might have. Okay, so um, I wanna start off by uh, just saying something that maybe already has confused people, but I, I'll put it on the table now. Um, COVID-19 is a disease and that's a disease caused by a virus, um, which is a coronavirus, a kind of virus, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that I'll call SARS-CoV-2. So if you see SARS-CoV-2 and you say, well, how does that relate to COVID-19? That's actually the virus that causes the disease. And disease ecologists try to be a little bit precise about that because uh, uh, precisely, we, uh, the virus is spread from person to person, not the disease. The disease is actually a condition of the host. So it's you feeling bad or you getting sick or you dying, things like that. That's the disease and we have a name for that. And we differentiate that from the pathogen that causes the disease. And the reason for that is that, of course, you can actually sometimes be infected with the virus and not have symptoms. So, of course, that would mean you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, but you actually don't have COVID-19. So that's why we differentiate those things. So, um, so you'll see me use that language a little bit as we go forward. Okay, so the first concept I want us to try to um, kind of wrestle with in our heads here is what's called the reproduction number of the pathogen, which is um, sometimes written as R0 and sometimes as RT. Um, those two uh, writings of that symbol um, refer to either the reproduction number of the pathogen when the first case invades a community. So when the first infected person got to Santa Cruz County, we would refer to the reproduction number of the pathogen as R0 at that point. And then kind of any time after that first point where people's behavior starts to change or a fraction of the population is no longer, uh, uh, has a fraction of the population has immunity because they've been exposed and recovered, then we refer to the reproduction number as RT or R effective. Sometimes you'll see in some people's uh, writings of the popular press. So what this concept means, and this is a seminal concept in understanding diseases, it's the number of cases that each case goes on to infect. So if I get infected, do I go on to infect one other person, three other people, six other people, uh, so, so that's how we think about it. And the most crucial detail here, of course, which I think you can probably get into it, into it, is that if the reproduction number of a pathogen is less than one, if on average each person gives rise to less than one more case, then the number of cases will go down. So if there's 10 cases and on average each person gives rise to half of a case or half the people give rise to one case and half none, then you'll have less cases in the, in the future. In contrast, if the reproduction number is greater than one, then the number of cases will grow. And so this reproductive number is, uh, is a, a good way of understanding um, uh, how fast the cases will grow or shrink over time. Usually when we talk about <clears throat> the value of the reproduction number, we describe a population average. And so um, for example, if the reproduction number is two and a half, then that means after one kind of generation time for the pathogen and for SARS-CoV-2, that's about five to seven days or so. And so what we mean, if we say RT is 2.5, that means after about five to seven days, there'll be two and a half more cases, excuse me, two and a half times more cases than there were at the beginning. However, let me be clear that the population average, both for SARS-CoV-2 and for other diseases is uh, a little bit misleading in that, uh, as I'll actually show you detailed data later, um, there's a huge amount of variation from person to person in how many cases they give rise to. Um, and, and sometimes we have cases where a single person gives rise to many cases that we'll call super spreading events, which we'll talk about in detail a little bit later. Okay, so 
Um, so I should also have said at the beginning, and maybe it doesn't matter, I'll say it now, uh, this is going to be an interactive uh, uh, day today. So I'm actually going to have, I think, six or eight puzzles that I'm going to try to give you to work on to help you to try to engage with the material more and to really give you, I think, a better understanding. Um, and so the first of one is, well, the first of these is here already. And so, um, so the question is, is how can things get so bad so quickly, which they did with SARS-CoV-2? And so uh, to, to do this, I, I'm actually going to ask you to do a little bit of math that's relatively simple. And if you have either uh, a calculator, you can do it. Excel will do it. Uh, you can do it by hand if you wanted to uh, and approximate it, things like that. Anything like that is fine. <clears throat> so the puzzle is this. If there are 10 cases in Santa Cruz today and the generation time for SARS-CoV-2 um, is uh, two and a half, which is actually approximately correct. Um, the, the estimates for SARS-CoV-2 before we had any of these shelters in place or restrictions or things like that um, it was estimated all across the world. The numbers were usually between one and a half, <clears throat> excuse me, and five um, with the numbers between two and three showing up very frequently. So I'll often use two and a half as an example of the spread of this virus under kind of normal social conditions. So if we have a reproduction number of two and a half and the generation time is five days, I want you to try to calculate how many cases there will be 30 days later. So recognize that that's uh, more than one generation. In fact, it's six generations later. Um, and, uh, and so uh, if you can, I want you to actually calculate how many cases there might be um, uh, in uh, three, uh, excuse me, 30 days or one month later. So I'll give you actually a, a couple minutes to do that. Um, and if you want extra credit because that seems easy for you um, and you don't have to do it, but you can, it turns out that the cases we detect of SARS-CoV-2 or of COVID-19 are actually the person that, that we detected as a case actually got infected about 10 days ago. And the reason for that is that usually it takes, um, we'll talk about this in detail later, usually it takes five to seven days for people to get sick and then a few days for them to go to the doctor and a few days to get the tests back. And so in fact, by the time we have a case, that person actually was infected 10 days ago. So in fact, if you want extra credit, you could ask how many actual infections are there on day 30, even though that we haven't actually detected all the cases yet. So I'm gonna give you a, a minute or two to, or a couple minutes actually to do this calculation, just so you can try to impress upon yourself if there were 10 cases today, and you might think how bad could things get in a month? If you do this calculation, you'll find out. You want an answer? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, so well, okay. not, not just yet. Let me give everybody okay. two minutes or so, and then I'll ask everybody to, um, to provide an answer either by typing it in the little chat box or by saying it, either one will be fine. And of course, I'll step through it uh, after we give a couple minutes chance for everybody to work through it. So. Good people, one more minute. All right, so let's see if we can actually step through and see how we can get there. Um, we have a few suggestions coming up in the um, in the chat box. If people want to click on the chat, they can see other people's um, ideas. And so the idea here is that if there's 10 cases today and the reproduction number is two and a half, that means, and the generation time for those cases is five days, 
That means after five days, there should be two and a half times 10. But then if we wait five more days after that, so 10 days from now, then those 25 cases, right? 10 times two and a half is 25. Those 25 cases, those then get multiplied again by this reproduction number of two and a half to give us 20, 25 times 2.5 cases and so on. And if you do that six times to get yourself to 30 days, then we end up with this calculation here. So, um, so if there's 10 cases today, the reproduction number is two and a half and the generation time is five days. After 30 days, there's 10 times two and a half times two and a half times two and a half, six times. And so the total number is 10 times two and a half to the sixth power. And if you do the math on that, it's actually 2,441 cases after 30 days or one month later. So I don't know about you guys, but to me, that's a lot of cases. And so after just one month, if you start with 10 infected people and you end up with 2,441 cases, that's a lot. Um, and even worse than that, because of the delay I just said a minute ago, the fact that people get infected and don't become cases until about 10 days later, at that same time, 30 days later, if we had 10 cases today, the number of infections we'd actually have after a month would probably be somewhere around 15,000. So that's a pretty crazy number. And so I've made a couple graphs just to help you, your brain kind of look at that. The lower left graph down here, which actually, let me see if I can uh, use the little pointer tool. Um, today, the number of cases is 10. You can barely see it on the graph at all. But after five days, 10 days, and so on, all the way to 30 days, the number of cases that we have rises up really kind of exponentially, this kind of accelerating shape up to about 2,500 cases. Um, one way people try to look at um, data to see if the number of cases is growing exponentially, which is the way that um, this is described here, is to actually plot the, the number of cases or the numbers on a log scale. And so if you do that and there is exponential growth, then you'll actually get a line. And so these are the kind of generation intervals of the number of five day periods after today. And this is the number of cases. And of course your eye can hopefully see that this is kind of a nice straight line. And that's because of course, we're just multiplying things in an exponential way. So I hope that impresses upon you how important it is to not uh, wait and see, well, we have a few cases now and they're growing, but let's just give it a month and see if this really turns into something bad, right? So I think if we take that tact, then we can get a huge number of cases in a relatively short amount of time. And I'll also say, um, because it's quite important that the reproduction number the higher it is above one, the faster this, this growth occurs. So a number of two and a half is, um, is moderately high and that gives us this huge rise in cases. If the number is lower, which it is thankfully it has been uh, when we put these um, social distancing and restrictions into place, it's often been around between one and one and a half. And so thankfully cases grow slower, but still pretty fast. So, um, so that's the first part that I wanted us to try to understand is just how fast this virus can grow through our populations. Okay, so, um, so that was just to try to motivate us to care to realize why we should really, I think, be a little bit concerned about this virus. So what I wanna talk about next is what is this virus? Where did it come from? How is it related to other things that we know about? So SARS-CoV-2, which is the name for the virus that causes COVID-19, that stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome dash Coronavirus 2. Um, and that's of course, because it causes Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, a, a serious respiratory disease, especially in um, people that are older and have some health conditions that we'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. Um, so uh, biologists usually try to classify organisms to group the, the ones together that share evolutionary relationships. And when we do that, um, this virus is in the family of viruses called coronaviridae, which includes a bunch of other coronaviruses, and it has its own genus as well called beta coronavirus. The reason that's important and useful for thinking about is that there's actually other coronaviruses that we know of that also infect people. There's four of them that cause common, the common cold. So the kind of symptoms that we normally get with the common cold. Um, some of the viruses that cause the common cold are coronaviruses. Um, and they have these funny names that I'm not gonna expect you to remember at all, but in case you see them in the news or something like that, um, you'll at least have seen them here once. So the four viruses that cause the common cold that are coronaviruses are called 229E, NL63, HKU1, and OC43. That's not neither here nor there, but those are just names for those viruses. And then there was actually a coronavirus that caused severe acute respiratory syndromes previously um, back in 2003, and that was called SARS-CoV, well, it's now called SARS-CoV-1. You may have heard it in the news called SARS back then. Um, and so, uh, so this virus is actually close enough related to that virus that we basically just gave this the same name as that one, but stuck a two on the end of it. Um, so that's the fifth coronavirus that we know infects people. And then the sixth one is something called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Virus, or MERS, which you may have seen in the news um, because it first was detected in the, in the Middle East, but it's now been found in other countries as well. Okay, so that's me just trying to tell you that 
Um, this is a coronavirus, but it's not the only coronavirus that infects people. There's actually uh, several other viruses that infect people from the same group of viruses. And we've actually used, uh, especially early on in this pandemic, we actually used our knowledge of other coronaviruses to guess some of the properties of this virus. And that was because we simply didn't have any information, but we, we reasoned that if this virus is similar to other coronaviruses, maybe it would share some of those same biological properties. So in fact, a lot of the early discussion about um, might we get immunity to this virus? And if so, how, might, how long might it last? We're based on these other viruses. Okay, um, and I'll also say that of these uh, six other coronaviruses that, are, um, that also are, infect people, four cause the common cold, which is relatively mild. Um, in contrast, both SARS-CoV-1 or the original SARS and MERS are actually quite deadly viruses, actually substantially worse than SARS-CoV-2. Um, so um, so uh, this virus is intermediate between those two viruses in terms of deadliness, and we'll talk about that actually in more detail in a minute. Okay, so, um, so the other thing that, that we don't know yet is exactly where this virus came from. So we'd like to know what, where did it come from? We were 99.9% .9 sure it came from a wild animal. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. Uh, one is, is that these other kinds of viruses um, uh, in this group of coronaviruses um, have wildlife reservoirs either in bats or rodents. What it means to have a wildlife reservoir is that these viruses are circulating in those wild animal species. And if you go and sample a population, you can often find uh, these viruses. Um, so when we first had this virus and people uh, could look at it and say, what, is this, what kind of virus is this and what is it similar to? Um, people said, well, it's probably, it's wildlife reservoir where it came from and spilled over into people was probably either a bat or a rodent. Um, that was the, kind of the first hypothesis based on closely related viruses. Um, the work that we've done more recently has, has shown us that the viruses that are most closely related to this virus evolutionarily, meaning ones that um, like brothers and sisters of this virus, um, come from um, bats. The most closely related ones actually comes from bats. Um, but there are actually been a few viruses detected um, in a species of animal that uh, you may or may not have even heard of called a pangolin. And so, um, so that was really kind of raised people's eyebrows and we wondered, you know, is it really the case that this virus came from pangolins? And if so, how did pangolins give this virus to people? Um, and the, there's a long story there, but the short version of it is that um, pangolins, while they're an amazing, cool kind of anteater-like species um, that has these really amazing scales, uh, while they're uh, a wild animal and normally, uh, you know, kind of live out there and do their thing, they are actually traded. Um, uh, people eat them and, and uh, actually use their scales um, uh, to make some things. So there's actually a wildlife trade for pangolins, and people thought that we might have gotten this virus from pangolins um, uh, because of our habits of, of interacting with them that way. So uh, some more careful analysis has shown that at least so far, the most closely related virus to this virus, to SARS-CoV-2, um, is actually still a bat virus, although pangolin viruses are, are similar. Um, most people think that pangolins probably aren't the aren't the original reservoir for this virus, um, but they may have been a, a host that, that the, the virus passed through on its way to people. So there's actually not, that we don't have a definitive answer yet on what the reservoir for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 is yet, um, but most people think it'll probably end up turning out to be a bat, um, but possibly it may have passed through another wildlife species. So that's uh, what, what I'll say about um, the reservoir for this disease or the origin of this virus. Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, if it affects bats, can it infect other species? And if you've been following the news, the answer is yes. This virus can infect a ton of other species besides people and its reservoir, which may be a bat. We're not totally sure yet, but that's a possibility. It turns out we now know this virus um, can infect a whole range of hosts at different levels. So um, there's some subset of animals that are both susceptible, can become infected, and actually can pass the virus on to another species, excuse me, another individual of their own species. And the ones that, uh, that we now know that about include felids, which basically include the cat. So that's true both for domestic cats, which I've got a little picture here, as well as tigers have been found infected with this virus. Basically in a zoo, a person got infected and gave it to the tigers. So we know cats can get it. And we know from laboratory experiments that actually cats can both get infected and give it to other cats. So cats can actually spread it also. Thankfully, it turns out, they don't seem to do that very often. And as far as I'm aware, there's either, there's no cases of cat human transmission while there are many cases of human to cat transmission. So while they can become infectious, they don't appear to be very infectious. And we don't seem to have much transmission from cats to people yet, which is great. Um, another group that be can become infected and become infectious and can transmit it to people are the mustelids, which basically are the weasels. And that includes things like minks and ferrets. And so, um, so as you may have heard, if you've been following the news also, 
there were actually have been large outbreaks of this virus um, in um, mink farms that were farmed for, um, for fur, for jackets and things like that. And so um, the virus actually spread quite efficiently among these mink and even started to mutate a little bit to make new, new forms that we hadn't quite seen in people before. So people were quite worried that this virus might infect minks, evolve a bit. We wouldn't know exactly what direction it would evolve and then uh, infect, go back and infect people and we might get a new strain in people. So, um, so there's been a huge amount of attention to try to reduce that from happening. And there's actually been a bunch of mink farms that have actually had to cull or kill all of their animals that they, because they came infect, infected with this virus. So, um, so we know mink and, and uh, other mustelids can become infected and spread it. Um, we're not quite sure whether it came from bats. We haven't actually found this virus or a close relative in bats yet, but from laboratory experimental infection studies, uh, we know that some kinds of bats can become infected and can spread it. And so I have a picture down here of a really amazing kind of bat, a Rosetta's bat, a Egyptian fruit bat. And these bats um, live in, in, uh, in Africa and eat fruit and they're amazing uh, creatures, and, but they can become infected and also spread the virus to each other. So that's another species that we know can do that. Um, primates, actually a couple different kinds of primates we now know are actually can become infected and actually can be infectious as well. And just last week, um, uh, a couple of gorillas at the San Diego Zoo became infected um, again from a zookeeper. Um, and one of them actually got sick enough that they actually gave it the same kind of uh, treatment or antibody cocktail um, that the president, people like that got. So um, so we're, it was a zoo animal, obviously, and it's a gorilla, which uh, there aren't that many of those guys in the zoo, so we wanted to protect it and take care of it. So it actually got the kind of best treatment we could give an animal. Um, there's a few smaller animals that also can become infected and actually can become infectious. And those include hamsters, tree shrews, and mice. And those have all been studied quite a bit for, um, for doing science on this virus and try to understand the virus more. Uh, so in contrast to those groups of animals that I just showed up here, which can become infected and can actually infect someone else or some other animal, um, there's some animals that can become infected, but don't appear to really make enough virus in their body or the virus doesn't replicate very well, so they can't seem to infect other animals. And that includes dogs and cows. So in the laboratory and in nature, we've seen some dogs get infected, but when we actually do it in a laboratory experiment, those dogs basically don't get enough virus in their lungs to go on to infect other dogs. And the same is true with cows. In contrast to those species, there are some animals we tried to infect that just don't seem to get infected. And so, um, so pigs are one of those. We tried to infect pigs in the laboratory. Um, and I'll say to you, I'll, I should say again, I'm gonna use the word we sometimes when I describe science. And I don't mean myself personally, I mean kind of the whole scientific set of scientists working on this disease. So pigs, um, basically we tried to infect pigs in the lab, but it didn't actually work. They didn't really get infected at all. The same is true for chickens and ducks. So you might be saying, wow, this virus can infect a lot of different kinds of species, not everything, but quite a few. And, and is that kind of normal or not for, for this virus? Are there other things that do something like that? So the answer is yes. Um, there's actually, this is what we call a multi-host pathogen, which means it can infect multiple species of animals. And there are many other things that are also multi-host pathogens. Um, so the way that it infects multiple species of animals is because the way this virus actually infects you is it actually binds to a receptor on, in, in your lungs called ACE2, which you'll probably see in the news sometimes. And it turns out that many different kinds of animals have a similar receptor. And because this virus uses that kind of receptor with a certain shape, it can actually infect multiple kinds of animals. So what I wanna do is zoom out for one second, just to kind of put this in, in context and perspective. There are about 1500 different kinds of pathogens that we know can infect people and cause disease. So that includes viruses, bacteria, fungi, protists, all kinds of things like that. Of those 1500 kinds of pathogens that infect people, almost two thirds infect some other kind of animal also. So in fact, the majority, the two thirds of all the things that cause disease in people also can infect some other kind of animal. So it's not strange or rare that this virus can infect us and other things. That's actually closer to the norm than the exception. So in fact, um, so a big question obviously that naturally arises is, is where, what hosts are we likely to get new diseases from? So what are the reservoirs that we should worry about the most if we're worried about the next uh, say virus or bacteria that might infect people. And it turns out that there's a bunch of work on this topic. Um, and I've showed two graphs here that I'll talk through in a second. The general finding is that uh, a, a pathogen that infects one species is more likely to infect another species if those two species are closely related evolutionarily. So what I've shown here in these two graphs, um, the x-axis, uh, so let me just tell you how the experiments were done, or at least in the bottom. So 
first, let me just comment the, the bottom study was actually done by Professor Greg Gilbert here at UC, University of California, Santa Cruz in the Environmental Studies Department. And this is still considered the most elegant study or paper on this topic. And so what um, Greg Gilbert and his uh, colleague uh, uh, Cameron Webb did, which is amazing, is they went in the forest and actually isolated a bunch of different kinds of um, pathogens of plants. And then they tried to infect other plants which, with each of those kinds of pathogen. And the different kinds of, of plants they tried to infect, they then said, how closely related is the kind of plant I got this, virus, this pathogen from, and then to the plant that I tried to infect with it. So the x-axis here is basically how close together uh, evolutionarily the two plants were, and the y-axis is, is the fraction of this other plant species that actually became, uh, were able to get infected and show a little bit of damage from that pathogen. And so what your eye can hopefully see is that if two things are very closely related evolutionarily, that is to say their phylogenetic distance between them, the evolutionary distance between them is low, the pathogen has a quite high chance of being able to infect that other host. So uh, because uh, maybe some of us can think less about plants and more about animals, um, I'll show you the top graph. It has the exact same pattern. The x-axis is again divergence time or evolutionary distance between species, and the y-axis is the fraction of pathogens that are shared. What this data is basically saying is that things that were closely related to, like chimpanzees, gorillas, um, things like that, their pathogens are much more likely to infect us than another animal that's very, very evolutionarily distant from us. So maybe say something like, um, I don't know, a platypus or something like that that's really, really far away, or a kangaroo or something like that, which has, um, uh, in evolutionary time, has diverged from humans uh, millions and millions of years ago. So we're much more likely, if there's a pathogen in an animal, if we want to ask, will it infect people, um, the chance of it infecting people is much, much higher if we're more closely related to them. However, so, so that's the, the, this pattern has been found over and over and over again. This is really great experimental data by Greg Gilbert and his team in plants. Here's some kind of observational data in primates. Um, there's actually been a bunch of other studies on this that all show this pattern. But let me say something very clearly. While there is a relationship there, it's not a perfect relationship. And so uh, there are pathogens that come from relatively distant hosts that can infect us. So it's not a perfect um, tool to find out where the next pathogen might come from. And for example, there are several um, pathogens that have come from things like bats, which are not you know, primates, they're not closely related to us, but the viruses still can infect us sometimes. So I, I'm trying to convey a general principle that we found across um, nature, but also indicate that it's not a perfect rule, that there's quite a bit of variability around that. Okay, so the last thing I wanna say about that is that um, even if a pathogen could infect us, if we came in contact with that animal, you're never gonna be getting infected with a pathogen of an animal unless you have contact with that animal. So one of the key things that <clears throat> um, people are trying to do to reduce the chance of things like COVID-19 popping up or SARS-CoV-2 um, arising is to, for us to reduce our contact with wildlife in a way that can spread pathogens. So for example, um, if there's an intact forest with a huge variety of, of plants and animals in it, let's say in the tropical forests, and we go into those tropical forests and we, let's say, uh, hunt the animals that are there and eat them, in, in that process of hunting them and, and chopping them up before we cook them, um, that's a very good way, unfortunately, for us to have contact with an animal and be exposed to the, the pathogens that are in that animal and therefore we can get infected with them. So, um, so there's a, a quite a bit of effort right now to revisit ways that we interact with wildlife and try to make it so that we do so um, less so or do so in distant ways, like with binoculars, they're seeing them from tens of meters away where they won't be able to infect you, where they can't give you their path. Um, so that's a, an important uh, thing to think about as we move forward. Okay, so, um, so that's about enough about the kind of origin of the pathogen and, and sharing of pathogens between species. Um, I wanna talk a little bit now about not just how SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted, but a little bit of the kind of nitty gritty details behind it that I hope will give people a slightly better understanding <clears throat> of some of the things you might've heard of. So the three ways that we think that this virus and other respiratory viruses like it can be transmitted are first, when you're um, breathing or talking or yelling or singing, anything like that, um, we're emitting, obviously, uh, air out of our mouth, but with that air are little particles. And of course, if you're in a very cold place, you sometimes can see your breath, and that's you actually being able to see those particles of, of water that are coming out. And so if you are infected with this virus, then those little particles have virus in it. And so um, it turns out when you breathe out, and especially when you talk or sing, you'll emit more and more of those particles, but you actually emit particles of two different sizes. So a subset of the little particles you emit from your mouth are big, relatively speaking, 
So little kind of small droplets of water you can imagine. And those ones are so big that they in fact are heavy. And so when you emit them out of your mouth, they kind of, they fly forward, but then gravity hits them and they basically start to fall. And, and most of those moderate or to large sized particles um, drop within just the first couple feet around us. So if you actually had a little laser and could see those particles, you would see them kind of come out and then fall. And people describe that kind of transmission as a ballistic trajectory of large droplets. So it's basically flying out like a cannonball you can imagine out of your mouth and then gravity hits it and it falls to the ground. And so that's what these big droplets here in this graph are showing. Um, we think that, uh, so yeah, so that's the big droplets. We also emit smaller droplets that um, gravity also affects, but are small enough that kind of just light breezes and things like that can pick up and also move around the air around us. And so those are often called aerosols or these small droplets. And those can in fact um, travel much further. So the ballistic droplets, these kind of big water droplets, people think uh, when we measure them, they generally don't go very far unless there's a really strong wind. They usually fall down within just a few feet around us. In contrast, the small finer particles that can drift on the air and actually travel much further. Um, but when it does travel further, um, A, they're smaller particles, so they contain less virus per particle, and B, they get diluted as they're just kind of an expanding gas around us. And so, um, so I, I give you these two um, modes of transmission because they really help us to understand a couple things. First, it turns out if we're standing near someone and either breathing or talking to them, especially in their face, there's a decent chance we will emit some of these particles that then they can actually inhale, go into their, either their mouth or nose or go in their eyes, and that can infect them. And in fact, um, when we look at the data that we have out there and all the ways the virus is spread, um, the majority of all transmission is done either by these kind of large particles at short range, or you can imagine kind of a, la a large puff of small particles that haven't had a chance to get diluted yet, and therefore the other person breathes them in. And so that um, results in infection in this kind of short range here. And that's where the magical six foot rule came from that you guys have all heard thousands of times now. Why do you try to stay six feet from people? Because if you're six feet away, the chance that these large droplets will fly six feet before you breathe them in is very, very low. In addition, even though these smaller droplets, this, these aerosols can move much further than uh, two or three feet, they get diluted as they do so. And as you get further and further away, the gas, this kind of um, aerosols that we're emitting from our mouths get diluted enough that there's not enough virus in there to infect you. And so that's why the six foot rule is quite helpful, both against these ballistic large particles and against small particles. It's the combination of those two things that really um, uh, makes short range transmission extremely likely. Um, the third, uh, uh, let's see, I'll go, yeah, before I go to the third way, I'll say that it is possible for these aerosols, these kind of small particles to infect another person more than two meters away. And that's what this person over here is doing. This person here is breathing in aerosol particles from a person that's say five meters away. And you might say, is that possible? Is that likely? And the answer is yes, it's possible. We have some good definitive cases of that. You then ask, what is it likely? And I'll tell you that it's likeliness is highly dependent on uh, one key factor, which is ventilation. So if you're in a small enclosed airspace with someone and there's not that much air and the other person that's infected breathes quite a bit, let's say for several minutes or even an hour, and basically fills that airspace with this, these aerosol particles with virus in it, and you're in that same space, then there's definitely a, a decent chance you can get infected. In contrast, if you're outside, the kind of dispersal, the expansion of those aerosol particles gets so diluted by the air around you that uh, the chance of transmission of, by these aerosols from distances greater than six feet is, is as close to zero as we could possibly imagine. So there are no <clears throat> definitive records of a person infecting another person from 10 feet away outside. It's never been documented. And so that's because of the way that the physics works. So, um, <clears throat> so I hope that, that we can, with that, recognize that if we want to stay safe, we want to stay, you know, that six foot rule away from other people if we can. Um, but if we're in an indoor setting, there's still some risk, even if we're further away than that. Okay, so the last um, uh, way we think that the virus can be transmitted is what we call a surface transmission or fomite transmission. And that's basically where we, let's say, either sneeze or cough on our hand or we sneeze or cough and those particles um, from our mouth go and land on a surface and then someone else touches that surface and then touches their eye, nose, or mouth and then it gets into their lungs that way. So that's another possibility. Um, and interestingly, early on, we thought that might be a major way this virus would be transmitted, but subsequent epidemiological evidence has shown us that that really doesn't happen very often. In fact, those of us that study this can point to all of the cases where there's ever been demonstrated uh, surface transmission and there's just a few of them. So a little bit of a puzzle that we don't fully understand why it's 
doesn't seem to happen very often, but that ends up being great because we can worry much less about every surface we possibly touch being infected. So that's, um, that turns out to be a positive. So, um, so that's what I want to say about how the virus is transmitted. On the bottom of the graph here, I've given you, uh, based on epidemiological evidence, about the fraction of infections that we think occur through these kind of short range interactions. It's uh, the majority, great majority of all cases are that way. There are a few cases in some settings by longer range, especially in the indoor um, or say within a car, that definitely is, pos is possible. And then we do have a couple cases that have occurred by surface transmission, but very, very few. What I'd like to have you do next, the next kind of um, active part of this class is for you to write down for each of these three ways of transmission occurring. So short range, surface transmission or long range aerosols, what's the best thing we can do to actually control or to reduce the chance of that transmission occurring? So I've already kind of given you a hint and mentioned one of them, but there's a couple other ones that we haven't talked about that obviously can be useful for these things. So take a minute or so um, and see if you can write down the ways, the best things we can do to reduce the risk of transmission by short range transmission via these kind of ballistic trajectories and a little bit of aerosols, the surface transmission and the longer range aerosols. And I'll give you a minute or two and then we'll talk about it. All right, so we have some great suggestions um, in the chat box popping up. Um, and so, uh, so let's go ahead and actually step through each of these uh, possibilities. Um, and then I'll, there's actually one answer as well, um, in the, excuse me, one question in the chat that I'll answer as well. So, <clears throat> um, so the tools that we usually have to try to reduce the chance of transmission of these three different ways are what people put in the chat. So obviously um, masks are great for actually stopping the particles that are coming out of your mouth from getting anywhere. Um, and so, uh, so masks end up being great for this mode of transmission. Um, having distance between people, which I mentioned several times, obviously the six foot rule, that helps quite a bit with this mode of transmission. And then it turns out even, um, even for short range stuff, if there's some ventilation, that will reduce the chance that that uh, kind of uh, particles coming out of your mouth will get to the next person and they'll breathe them in. So ventilation can also be helpful for short range transmission, although for the kind of ballistic particles, not as much. So um, the question in the chat, which I want to address now with, with that, is that what about the chance of this kind of transmission outdoors? And the answer is, um, it is definitely possible, and we have records of cases of people that have infected other people outdoors when there's been quite close contact or interaction. So basically, if you're having a conversation with someone from just a foot or two away and you're talking, then even though you're outdoors, it's definitely possible for the particles from your mouth to go out and get inside, of, uh, basically have them breathe those particles in and get infected that way. The risk is substantially lower and it's much, much lower if you have a little bit of distance between you. But if you basically have a close conversation outdoors, then certainly that's possible, especially if, there aren't, if people aren't wearing masks. So, um, so those are the main tools we have for the close range transmission are masks, ventilation, and distance. Um, as people said down here, excuse me, in the chat, um, the kind of surface transmission route, if you can basically wash your hands, that helps a lot with that. And obviously not touching your face, those are the two ways that really can reduce that transmission. And then this long range um, aerosol transmission, uh, masks can help uh, quite a bit, but for it to really completely block this, it needs to be a mask that really fully covers your face and the um, air has to all pass out through the mask. And so, um, so most of the masks that people wear, excuse me, non-healthcare workers wear, um, usually quite a bit of the, uh, the air that you breathe out comes out through the sides of your mask and that makes it less effective at stopping the aerosols. Not completely ineffective, 
but not as effective as we would like it to be. So I should actually have masks here as well in the far right corner. Um, but it, what ends up being really important for aerosols are um, having uh, ventilation or being outdoors. So really the risk of transmission outdoors, if you just have a little bit of space between people is extremely low. Okay, so that's that part. And so what I wanna give you next um, is tell you about a study and, and ask you a couple of questions about it um, uh, that I think this is a study that happened early in the epidemic and I think could have been the most useful study I could possibly imagine um, doing, except for some challenges that arose later. So I'm gonna give you guys uh, the study and then kind of have you guys think about it for a minute. So one thing we often want to know is, is what's the kind of risk or probability of getting infected with this virus if you sit various distances from someone for various amounts of time? So you can imagine asking, is it safe to go to a restaurant and sit, let's say, half a meter from someone or you know, a foot or two, or let's say 10 feet away from someone? And what if you're there for half an hour versus two hours or five hours or six hours? What's the differential probability of becoming infected? What's that risk? And if we knew what that was, we would know just how safe it was to have either um, uh, indoor dining, uh, people working in offices together, um, people going to school together, how long could you safely be in a, in a school environment together if you're in desks, let's say, that kind of stuff. So this kind of information would be extremely valuable. And so there was a study that addressed exactly that. So this is the study, and it was basically a study of transmission of this virus on trains. And uh, it was done with data in China where they had pretty meticulous records. So the Chinese had um, uh, records of all passengers on, on a set of trains in the entire country. And they knew through their national database of people that had been infected, who actually had been infected with this virus. So who had had COVID-19. And they could then match up who that person was sitting next to on when they were on the train. So they basically combed through all the passengers, found all the people that were infected, and then asked, did any of their seatmates around them get infected with the virus in the next, excuse me, or become a case, get sick and get tested positive in the next two weeks? And we'll talk about that two-week number in a minute, um, in a couple slides. But the idea here was to ask, what's the risk of transmitting this virus to someone else around you on a train? Um, and they did it by using these meticulous records of both all the people that had uh, that became COVID cases and when they took trains um, and exactly where they were sitting on the train. So they basically had assigned seats. And so the data that came from this study is shown in this um, graphic here. It's a little complicated, so I'll try to walk you through it carefully. So the, uh, the colors go from yellow, where basically no one got infected, to red, where the highest fraction of those people sitting in that seat got infected. So that's the kind of the color scheme, and that's what's called the attack rate, or the fraction of people that got infected. And there are um, uh, eight graphs here, and each graph has an X and a Y axis. So I'm going to explain what those mean. So uh, what the this axis here is the number of columns or seats apart. So if someone was sitting right next to you, then there would be one seat apart. That's this kind of one down here. There's also a one here, and there's a one here, and so on. So those are people sitting one seat apart, so just adjacent seats. This axis here are the number of rows apart, so sitting in the same row, which would be zero, or one row in front of you, or two rows in front of you, or two rows behind you. So they actually looked at <clears throat> all possible passengers within three rows on either side, and then up to five seats in either direction around you. And so that's the, that's the seating location. And then each one of these little graphs shows how long those passengers were sitting together. So they actually knew the trips that people took. And so you can see that um, the, this represents the chance that a person got infected if their train trip together was less than an hour, so between zero and one hour. This is one to two hours, two to three hours, three to four, four to five, five to six, six to seven, and seven to eight hours, or even more than eight hours. And so, um, so this represents the risk of the passengers or the seat mates becoming infected as a function of time going from less than an hour to seven to eight hours down here in this kind of snake-like way, and the chance of becoming infected given where you sat in terms of either how many rows you were apart or how many seats you were apart, which they called columns in the paper. And so that's the data. And so what I wanted you guys to do is to take a minute or two and just stare at this graph and tell me what you think it says about the chance of you becoming infected given that you sit next to someone else that we know is infected because we later have records of them being infected at the time. They become a COVID case. What's your chance of becoming a COVID case given where you sit and how long your train trip is with that person? So I'm gonna give you a minute or two to kind of think about that and um, maybe jot down notes if you want to. And then I'll ask you uh, the second part here, Q3B, which is, is it possible that there's an alternative explanation for the patterns that we're seeing here? 
And so, um, so we'll dig into that, which ends up being one of the challenges in interpreting the data from this, this study. So take a minute to do this. Yeah, so there's also a question about whether or not people that were the passengers, were they wearing masks or not? Um, and so uh, there was a little bit of mask use, but it was not widespread because these uh, train trips were taken before we really were knew exactly that there was a pandemic going on. So mostly there was um, not masks. Mask use was not a universal practice. Uh, another question in the chat, people asking about the ventilation. So these are um, the kind of uh, fast trains in China and they actually have relatively good ventilation um, like we have on airplanes and things like that. So relatively high um, uh, ventilation. And there's another question that I'll get to after we go to try to interpret the data in a second. Thanks for that, Garrett. So one more minute for people to kind of puzzle through this. All right, so uh, can someone maybe type into the chat or just uh, unmute yourself and tell us, what do you think this study initially at least suggests about the chance of becoming infected depending on where you sit and how long your train ride is? Can you give us just the general patterns? It seems it spreads more um, in, in single rows one thing. Okay, so you're suggesting that the chance to become infected is worse if you're in the same row as someone um, relative to, let's say, the same column of someone or the same uh, set of seats, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so I think the suggestion there, which I think is, is a great observation, right, is that if you look at the difference between the, ch or the chance of becoming infected is higher if you're have basically, if you're in the same row here, if you're just one row away, the chance of becoming infected seems quite a bit lower no matter how long the train trip was. Do you have another observation about the data? Well, the, one of the, 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 the one that you have your cursor on, the one where there's a, a minimum between the two maxima, makes me think that um, there's, a, there's some bypass uh, instead of just diffusion or, or, or direct flow, that maybe there's flow through the, the ventilation system for that, um, recirculates the air so that it skips over Got it. Uh, okay. different columns. So great question or great suggestion. Um, I think it turns out that with this kind of data and they don't show it so well in this graph, that's probably just actually variation in the data. So whenever you have studies like this, it turns out the patterns are never super clear and perfect. And so, uh, so I think that's possible that that's going on. Another possibility is that there's actually two seats and then the aisle, so or, excuse me, the, yeah, the walkway between the seats might be part of that but it's also possible it's just the kind of variability in the data. And so there was a question in the chat also about why is between, it seems like trips between five and six hours, those seem to be lower than trips four hours or trips six hours, why is that? And that's probably also just variability in the data. So um, so good suggestion, it's possible, but we can't quite pull that out with the data that we have here. Is how many one? cases How many cases were involved in this? It looks like it's, it's maybe based on a fairly small number. Well, so there, this is based on actually uh, tens of thousands of people. So it's actually an enormous really? study. Yeah, so it's a, a giant study. It's actually all <laughs> trained passengers in China over a couple, I think a month or two times. So it's pretty, it's as big a study as we could possibly imagine doing. Um, 
Okay, so so that's and there should be one more pattern that we want to try to pick up that we haven't mentioned. Yet. It's kind of obvious, but I want to just make sure we all kind of take it in. Can someone also comment on another pattern or two that we see? Well, the obvious one is, is if you're sitting next to somebody who has it, you are most likely to get it. Great. Thanks, Barry. So that's one of the patterns I want everyone to take in is just that if there's yep. only one seat between people, as Barry pointed out, then your chance of being infected is quite high. Barry, do you see one more strong pattern in the data that we should point out? Longer times oh, generally yes. makes more spread. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a train ride with someone that's less than an hour, your chance of becoming infected, all these seating locations are all relatively low. Whereas if you have an eight hour train ride or a six or seven hour train ride, your chance of becoming infected is much higher. So those are all great observations. And that's what um, people first thought when they looked at this study. And so this study got a lot of attention when it first came out. And then a few of us looked at it and had a little bit of puzzles. And two of you in the chat, or maybe even three or four, I haven't seen all of them, um, are offering an alternative explanation for this that we need to consider. And so, um, so I think it's Barbara and maybe Joseph earlier, maybe one other person said, um, is it possible that there's actually relationships amongst people that are partly responsible for explaining the difference in transmission that are not captured just by where you're sitting? Um, so for example, it might it be possible that, um, that some people know each other, whereas other people don't know each other. So it turns out, um, yeah, so this is the, what I want us to kind of now think through is that could these patterns represent transmissions on the train or is it possible that transmission actually occurred elsewhere, but we see it reflected in these patterns where people sit on the train? And so that's what people are, I think are hinting at in the previous slide, which is that what is the relationship between travelers that sit in different seats? And as I think Barbara said, is it possible that people that are sitting next to each other are also more likely to know each other? So that was a possibility. And it turns out the paper actually has some information to help us understand this better. So here's that information. So the paper said that they didn't, the, the data was anonymous. They didn't know people's names, but they did know whether the train travelers had the same itineraries or had different itineraries. And so what they did in the, in the paper in some kind of figures in the, what we call supplemental information, so kind of buried deep in the paper, mm -hmm. they showed the same data, but they showed it for people that had the same itinerary or different itineraries. And so this is what I'm gonna show you here. I'll try to walk you through it. So the X axis here on this left graph is how much time they spent traveling together. So how long was the trip that they spent together? And the Y axis is the fraction of people that got infected. And what you can hopefully see with your eye is that there's an increasing relationship. It's not perfect. There's a few little dips here that are a little strange that we could ponder about if we wanted to, but let's not focus on that for now. Recognize that there is an increasing relationship between the chance of a person that um, getting infected and the time that they spent on the train together. So that seems they're initially supportive. That's for all the people that had the same itinerary. However, if we look at the exact same data set with people that don't have the same itinerary, we see that the relationship is actually flat that you have no higher risk of getting infected, whether you're on a trip that's an hour or less or more than five hours. And in fact, if you plot these two data sets on the same graph, which I took the data from the paper and did that, you get this panel over here. And the reason I think that's important to do is because the Y axis on these two graphs, the chance of people becoming infected is different on the two graphs. And if you plot it together, you see that in fact, if you share the same itinerary, which is this blue line here, that's the same as this data over here, is much, much higher than if you don't share the same itinerary. And so what I think this data suggests is that it's possible that all the people that, that end up subsequently getting infected um, that were train travelers actually got infected not on the train, but actually off the train. And that the patterns that we see are actually just reflecting um, where two people that, that know each other, maybe live with each other or are coworkers, where they would sit with each other. So let me just take one step back and show you the graph and we can interpret that again and say, if you're gonna take a train trip with someone and let's say it's your spouse or your child, where might you want to normally sit? I think the answer is normally you try to get seats together, meaning you have seats in the same row and only one seat apart. You might also have a chance of them, if there's basically more than one of them, maybe they seat one, sit one or two seats apart. So maybe if there's a party of three, you would see them like that. In contrast, if you can't get seats together, excuse me, seats right next to each other, you might try to get seats one row apart or two rows apart. And so I think that these, the, the, the fact that the chance of getting infected is slightly higher if you're one row rather than say three rows, is stemming from the fact that if people know each other, they're still more likely um, to get a seat close together than, if, than further away. So, um, so after kind of digging into this and looking at these patterns, we now think that this study, while initially was amazing, we thought could really tell us a lot about the risk of transmission of this virus in the train. We actually now think that the data actually suggests that there was actually probably no transmission or almost no transmission on the train itself. But in fact, the patterns of infection simply represent uh, 
infection occurring off the train by people that you traveled with. And so there's good news and bad news. So the good news is that it seems like the evidence for transmission happening on trains is very, very low. And in fact, when we've looked at data from airplanes and things like that, um, there, is, there are some cases of transmission, but it's much, much lower than you would expect otherwise. The bad news is that we actually can't use this data to estimate the risk of you getting infected from someone if you sit with them for half an hour and you're two feet apart or five feet apart. So, um, so I, I gave us this example for two reasons. One, to let us to, to tell you guys that um, we actually have a bunch of data now on train travel and plane travel and things like that. And the risk is relatively low, not zero, especially if you're sitting directly adjacent to someone. Um, but that we also have to be a little bit careful in interpreting data. We can't always take it at face value. Sometimes it reflects something that, um, that has a different explanation. Okay, so um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think uh, we should probably take a little bit of a break now. Jim asked that we take a break kind of halfway through or somewhere in the middle of, of the day today. And so I think now would be a good time to do that. So um, Jim, can you comment on how long the break normally is or maybe Barry? Yeah, great, Marm. Uh, this is a perfect time. And uh, normally we take about a five minute break just to give people a chance to stretch and do whatever business they need to do. So I, I not see, let's see, let me look here. It's 1104. Uh, let's return at um, uh, 1110. Okay, we'll start up at 1110 again. Does that sound okay? All right with you, Marm? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Marm. That's fabulous. Uh, so interesting. So interesting. Is this talk being recorded? Yes, it is. Oh, good. 
Yep. No, it's I, I had my second vaccine during the first half of the talk. Uh, you can come back and watch it. I, I think you'll have to talk to Barry about how to access it because I don't know. Oh, I'll. I'm uh, sure he does. It'll be on our, our website. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was saying something and realized I was muted all that time. Uh, so lectures, you know, we didn't do number one, two and three are posted on the OLI website and this one will be there in two or three days. That's how people can access them. It's just a list of courses, OLI courses, and it go, takes you to a, a YouTube channel. <clears throat> Barry, can anyone access those or do you have to be a uh, uh, part of the network, uh, the OLE network to do that? Anybody can do it. You just go to UCSE OLE course videos and it takes you right there. Fabulous. Yep. Thanks. Are there going to be additional classes starting in February? Lois? Pardon? Ask about additional classes after this. Uh, well, that would be in February, Susan Hansi is here and her husband is giving a course on, uh, on his experience with Vietnam prisoners of war. He's a psychiatrist. Susan, do you want to say anything about it? Lois Dick is, uh, Dick is actually on this, on this um, Zoom. Yeah. Is I'm he? Here. Yeah, yep. there he is. There I am. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, I was the Air Force's medical expert on prisoners of war in Vietnam. And I have a talk with uh, pictures showing the uh, release uh, of the, the POWs. I was on the airplane that brought, one of the airplanes that brought them out of Hanoi. Uh, so I, I described that experience. And in the second session, I'll be describing uh, what the wives went through for their part. You know, they, they had an incredible problem not knowing if they were wives or widows for, you know, six, seven, eight years. <clears throat> I don't think we can have this in the middle of Mom's talk. Oh, it's in the... I guess it's okay to, to um, okay. give a little ad for his talk. I've heard shorter versions of this. It's absolutely fascinating. His um, PowerPoint uh, pictures are many that you would never have seen anywhere else. And I think uh, I, I think everyone will enjoy it. Everyone that I've ever talked to that has seen anything he's presented, he's done it several times, have been very enthusiastic. Never sure mind he's, he's my husband, I guess I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It sounds very good. I think you'll enjoy very it. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Yeah. As is today. <laughs> Should we go ahead and get yeah, that? Yeah, fabulous. Um, let's, uh, we're right at 1010 or a little, or sorry, 1110. Um, let's, let's get back to this, uh, to Marm's, Marm's uh, lecture. And uh, would everybody, Marm, you can go ahead and, and globally mute if you want. Uh, all right, Marm, Marm, maybe I'm, I'm getting ahead of things here, but a question that follows up all of these. And that is, th this seems to suggest that you, you need a fair amount of virus to have a chance of getting infected. So they, do they have data yet on what is the effect of dose of virus to cause an infection? Sure. So the answer is yes in lab animals, but not in people. There's a little bit of indirect information that way. Um, but the, the concept you're getting at, which is a, a great observation, is, is what's the infectious dose? We actually have kind of a whole terminology for that in this kind of work. Um, that's not known for a person yet at this point. It's actually kind of hard to estimate because you wouldn't want to experimentally give people different doses um, unless you were doing it for very good reason, which actually people are, are considering doing that for vaccine trials. Um, and so they would normally do that with young, healthy people that would have a very low chance of having any sort of severe disease. But those studies uh, sometimes do actually explore doses to try to help understand how the vaccines protect us. But um, that's not been done yet. And so we don't actually have that yet, but great question. Okay, super. So let me see if I can uh, uh, get to a couple more of our concepts that I want us to try to understand carefully today. And I 
I hope I also, I should have said more clearly in the goals at the beginning, um, what I'm hoping you'll get a little bit from today's talk is that some topics you may have already understood a little bit, but I hope that it'll also give you kind of a deeper understanding of those same topics. So that's really uh, one of my goals as well. So the next part that I want us to try to understand a little bit is what are the things that make up how fast this virus spreads? So I, I talked before about this reproduction number RT, and that's basically the number of cases that each case gives rise to, or put more simply, how many people does each person infect? That has three pieces to it. So uh, it's basically the product or the multiplication of the contact rate, meaning basically how many people do you actually have contact with, the chance that you pass on the pathogen, the kind of probability of transmission of you infecting someone, and how long you're actually infectious for. And so, um, so obviously you can imagine how many contacts do you have a day, what's the chance of you infecting each one of those contacts, and then how many days are you infectious? That's the idea here. So the contact rate, you can imagine measuring it a number of ways, but this actually gets a little bit of what um, Barry was just asking. CDC has created a kind of a, a, a surrogate or a, a definition, a way of kind of characterizing contact, which you all have heard of probably many times now, which is that if you are within six feet of someone for more than 15 minutes, the CDC considers that a contact. Um, and so, uh, so it turns out, excuse me, sorry, there's a phone call coming into my office line right now, I'll just ignore it. Um, the, the, those numbers are not magical numbers. There's nothing perfect about 14 minutes being totally safe and 16 minutes meaning you're absolutely infected. And there's no magical number about if you're five feet, you're gonna get infected and at six and a half feet, you're totally safe. So these are just approximate guidelines where if you're much longer than 15 minutes, your risk goes up quite a bit. If you're just a minute or two, your risk is lower. And if you're within one foot, your risk is very high. If you're 10 feet, your risk is very low. So these are basically um, nice, uh, good kind of guidelines for us, but they're not strict hard rules. And in fact, there was a news report about some uh, study that just came out suggesting that in fact, there are evidence of people getting infected when they spent less than 15 minutes together, and that shouldn't surprise any of us. That's less likely, but not zero. Okay, so, um, so the second part of this is to ask, What's the chance of you actually getting infected or in infecting someone else? And we know from lots of other work, and this gets at Barry's question, that that increases with the amount of virus that we expel and the susceptibility of the person that we expel that virus towards. Um, and especially if that person has been previously exposed to the virus and has immunity or has been vaccinated. So that actually matters as well. As I'll show later, vaccination helps, but is not 100% effective. And so this plays part, a part of this, but isn't the entire story. Um, and as I said a minute ago, the more time you spend with someone, so 15 minutes is a general rule, but the more time, the higher the risk of transmission and uh, uh, the chance of transmission decreases with the distance between people, whether ventilation is good or poor, and then whether people are wearing masks. And so, um, so those are just the pieces of that puzzle. Um, and so then the last part about this that I'm gonna try to give us a little bit more handle and deep understanding of is the infectious period. So how long are we actually infectious for this virus? And when are we infectious relative to when we get sick and relative to when we actually got infected ourselves? So that's what we'll talk about next. So you might ask, how long is the infectious period? How long are you infectious? And how can we actually calculate it? So you, some of you may have heard that if you uh, test positive for this virus, the general rule is that you're supposed to isolate, try not to infect anyone else, try not to be around anyone else for 10 days after your symptoms start. And so you might ask, where does this 10 days come from? That sounds like a nice round number. Is that really actually based on data? And so I'm actually gonna, well, I've showed you part of the data here that this is based on, and then have us puzzle through this. So this graph here, which I want you to try to kind of puzzle through and try to understand this 10 day rule, the X axis is the time since people first had some symptoms. So one is one day after they first, you know, they had a cough yesterday. So then we start to measure them on that day. The next day afterwards, that would be day one, day 10 would be out here, day 20 and so on. The Y axis, is that we um, have people, we took a swab from their nose or their mouth, um, or in this case, we actually, um, if they were sick, we actually took a tube and put it down their throat and got some actually some fluid from inside their throat. And that's this red uh, squares here called endotracheal aspirates. <clears throat> the blue is saliva. So basically just kind of a mouth swab. So this graph shows the amount of RNA. So remember this virus is an RNA virus. So it's the amount of, of coronavirus RNA on that swab, that's the y-axis, the x-axis is the time since that person first had any symptoms. And so I want you to puzzle through, that's these two questions here. How did CDC look at this data here and say, 10 days, 10 days sounds great. So take a minute or two and just kind of puzzle through that. And then after a minute or so, if you wanna start uh, typing in possible answers in the chat box, that would be great. <laughs> 
All right, so we have some suggestions and it's great. And so let me actually say two things. The first is that before they came up with this 10 day rule, the initial rules were uh, that you had to feel better. So you actually had to have no symptoms for a couple days. So you thought you'd like felt better and you had to have a negative test. Now, if you had to have a negative test, I don't know what you guys see from the graph here, but these data suggest that we sometimes get uh, positive swabs or sw people take a swab and test it for the RNA of this virus. And you can get a swab that actually has RNA on it going all the way out to about 24 days. So you can imagine if, if you just use the presence or absence of RNA on a swab and whether you feel good or not, you actually might have people having to, having to isolate for like 24 days. And that would be a very long time. So, so it turns out it's, uh, that's not what they picked. They, they decided to change the rules and give us this 10 day um, uh, guidelines. And the reason for that is because they decided, well, this is the amount of RNA, but might more RNA be more infectious? So this gets back to Barry's comment before about is there this known infectious dose? And so let me say two things and I'll show you an additional piece of data that the CDC is also using besides this data. So I will tell you that um, this kind of data, and there's a few studies like this, this is what was initially uh, used to make these decisions. So on the y-axis here is the amount of RNA on the swabs, and I probably should have said it, but these are actually log units. So even though you see kind of zero to 10, this is actually each one of these uh, numerical values is tenfold higher. So four is actually a hundredfold higher than two. So what you hopefully can see with your eyes that the amount of virus on the swab is going down over time, which is good. That means you're kind of, you're, there's less virus on the less viral RNA in the swab. So then at some point you might say, well, there's some there, but that's not enough to infect someone else. However, the thing that I, the reason I'm giving you guys this example is because in addition to this data, it turns out this is the amount of RNA on the swab and RNA is not the same thing as live virus. And the reason that matters is because when we get infected with this virus, it replicates like crazy. We get huge amounts of virus in our body, often millions of viral particles, and then our body starts killing it. And when it kills it, it doesn't always uh, completely uh, chop the pieces of RNA uh, into such small pieces that we can't detect it anymore. So even though there's dead virus there, we can sometimes still detect the RNA. And in fact, quite often we can still detect the RNA. So the CDC said, what's the relationship between the amount of virus that's there and the amount of live virus that's there? So the next slide shows that. Oh yeah, so let me just say that what the CDC did, first of all, is they said, well, if we go to 10 days and we go up to here to this blue line, they're basically suggesting that anything less than something like maybe four or four and a quarter or something like that, we're gonna say if you have less than that, then you're probably not infectious anymore. So that's the kind of arbitrary rule that seems to come from this. And a few in the, in the chat have suggested, that seems like a crazy idea. Why would you pick that? Why wouldn't you pick say four or three or five or any number like that, right? So I think that's fair, except we'll, I'll show you the next piece of data that also gets brought into this equation. So that's this. So here is the relationship between the amount of RNA and whether or not in a laboratory setting, we can actually find live virus in that sample. So the x-axis is the amount of RNA in the exact same scale we had on the last slide. And the y-axis is the fraction of those samples that we actually can find live virus in it. And the ones that we can find live virus are in red. And the, and the ones that we couldn't culture virus from that sample are in this kind of orange yellow color. And what your eye can hopefully see is when there's lots of virus there, so like seven or eight or nine, the fraction of those that have live virus in it is very, very high. And in fact, this little black line shows that fraction. And so you can see it gets up to as high as 90 or 100% up here. Whereas as the amount of RNA in a swab decreases, the chance we find or can culture virus, live virus from that swab goes down quite a bit. And in fact, that magical four and a half or 4.3 or so that was on that last slide, that's right around here. And so what you can see is that almost all those swabs that have less than that amount of RNA on them we can't actually find live virus there. So I'll show you the other slide again, just to remind you that what they're basically saying is, is that even though there's RNA on the swabs from these people, there's lower amounts of RNA. And in fact, every little one unit on this graph is tenfold lower. And the chance of there actually being live virus in those swabs is going down at the same time as well. So, um, so that's the, uh, that's why CDC has picked 10 days is because there's less and less virus the further you go from symptoms and the chance that the virus, excuse me, the RNA that's in your nose is, includes live virus is also decreasing. So the last thing I'll have you ponder just for a few seconds here is, what if you get tested on day 12 or day 14? What would that indicate about you? And what, should you then have to still isolate yourself? 
So what this data suggests is that if you test someone that's been infected on day, say, 12 or day 14 or day 20, they, there's a good chance they'll actually still have some RNA in their nose, but they're unlikely to be infectious because that RNA will not include live virus in it. It'll just be pieces of the virus, not live virus. And in fact, we now know that about 5 to 15% of patients will have RNA in their nose from this virus, but dead RNA for several months after they've been infected. And so we actually have a bunch of cases of that now. We now know that's actually a, a repeatable pattern. And we know from a bunch of studies that those people are actually not infectious, even though they're still shedding lots of RNA, even though there's still lots of RNA in their noses. Um, and so that ends up being important in understanding what, how do we interpret a test? Okay, so, um, so, so we're thinking about this infectious period. And so a couple aspects I wanna to touch on further. So th that data I showed you before, the x-axis, let me just take a step back and show you, was days since the onset of symptoms and it started at zero. What about before you have symptoms? What about negative one or negative two days before you have symptoms? What's the story there? So that's, um, that's that part. So then that'll bring us in this idea of what the incubation period is and why that's so important. And then we'll talk a tiny bit about variation in the incubation period among cases. We'll ask whether the incubation period itself influences the infectious period. And we'll bring in some other kinds of data we can use to measure the infectious period. Um, okay, so the first part is just asking, are you infectious before you have symptoms? And, and what is this thing called the incubation period and why is it important? So uh, what I've shown you here is, is a huge amount of data from a bunch of different studies together compiled at once, which describes the incubation period. So what does it mean? So the incubation period is the time from infection till you first start developing symptoms. So the first day you get a cough, the first day you have a fever and so on. The graph over here shows um, the relationship between how long it is from infection to you have your first symptoms and the fraction of people that have their first symptoms on that day. So what the graph shows, this kind of black line, is that on the first day after infection, almost no one shows any symptoms. On the second day, almost no one shows any symptoms. But after that, it starts to rise. So, um, so that's what the graph shows. And the table here just gives you kind of some numerical values for each of the percent of people over here and amounts of time. Um, and so what I want to do, have you do now is, is do one more kind of uh, active puzzle here is the CDC um, initially recommended a 14 day quarantine following exposure. So they said, if you came up against someone, if you had contact with someone, especially close contact and they were infected, we think that you should go and uh, quarantine yourself, try not to contact anybody else for 14 days and monitor yourself for symptoms. And if you get sick, obviously get tested. Um, but after 14 days, we think you're probably okay. So I want you to puzzle up this graph and the table and ask ourselves, is that, why did they come up with that magical number of 14 days? And does that actually miss some people? Are there people that actually are in, still gonna get symptoms later? So they actually are infected, but we miss them by using a 14 day quarantine. So take a, just a minute or so to try to puzzle through that. What are they, why do they pick 14 days? Why not 10, why not 20? And then is 14 perfectly safe or are we still missing some people with a 14 day quarantine? All right, so I don't see any uh, answers in the chat, but if anybody wants to, okay, yeah. So we have one suggestion that if we use a 14 day, then we might just miss a subset of people like only about maybe 2% or so. Um, and so the, the suggestion here, CDC looked at these data and said, well, if we quarantine people for five days, right? Then five days is here that would go up there. By that time, about half of people have developed symptoms, but half people haven't. So if you said after five days, you're good, then you'd miss about half the people that are actually going to go on to develop symptoms and were in fact infected and you miss those people. So five days seems like a bad idea. If you take that out to 14 days, which is basically this dashed line here, you can see that basically we, of those people that will go on and develop symptoms, about 97-ish percent have done so by that day, which is good, right? So it means we catch 97% of people that are gonna get symptoms and we know they're infected by symptoms, but we still miss a couple percent. So I hope that that part, that dual part of understanding where this 14 day thing came from 
is important, but also the fact that that doesn't catch every single case. There's still a few percent of people that were in fact infected, but don't get sick by day 14. Okay, um, so yeah, so so just to interpret this graph to give you guys a little better sense of the, the real data is that if you get infected, almost nobody gets sick until in the first couple of days. It really takes a couple of days for you to really kind of the virus to get going and you actually to get some symptoms. Half of people get sick by day five, 90% get sick by day 10, and 98% um, get sick by day 14, but after that, there's still an extra 2% left afterwards. Okay, so that's the incubation period part. And so then um, uh, we'll think a little bit about the incubation period and how that actually affects when you're actually infectious. And I'm gonna bring in a new kind of data that we can use to address when you're actually infectious. So, um, so this study uses data on what we call infector-infectee pairs. That is to say a person that was infected and gave it to someone else, and when did they actually and when they contacted that other person, when did they have contact relative to the first person getting sick or not? So the x-axis here is the days that the person that was the infector that infected the other person, the day post-infection for them. The dashed lines are when they first had their symptoms. And as I showed in the previous graph, some people have their symptoms just after three days. Some people have their symptoms five and a half days after they get sick. Some people have their symptoms 10 days or nine days after they got sick. The y-axis on this graph is given that you contacted a person that many days after they got infected and that many days relative to when they were sick, what's your chance of becoming infected? And so this graph, this kind of data in this graph actually ends up being extremely important because it shows us that your chance of becoming infected is actually highest. So the highest kind of part of the blue line, this magenta kind of line or the orange line, the highest part of that is actually just before the dash lines, which are the day on which the person has their first symptoms. So in fact, your peak infectiousness tends to occur one to three days before you're sick. So you feel totally fine that you're actually at your peak infectiousness. And so that's the first major finding here that came from this paper and a few papers like this. Um, so that's really, really important, right? It means we can't just say, if you feel fine, you're not infectious. It means you can feel totally fine and actually not just be infectious, but be peak infectiousness. So that's terrible. Um, and in addition to that, people that have longer incubation periods, so it takes longer between infection and symptoms, that's this orange line here, nine days, they are actually infectious further in the past or further before they get sick than people that have a shorter incubation period. So those people where basically they don't get sick for let's say 10 days, but they, they are in fact infected and get sick on day 10, they actually were infectious, not just on days eight or nine, but probably actually on days five, six and seven as well. So this is some recent work that I was able to work on with some colleagues in the UK. Um, so yeah, so that's the major take home here. And what I wanna say that's really, really important here is that any disease for which you are infectious before you are sick, that makes it very difficult and actually impossible to control the disease by just saying, if you're sick, stay home, because the, the reverse of that implies if you feel fine, go out and hang out with your friends, that means you actually could infect them. So that's actually been, uh, if you said, what's the, the most, the two most important things that have made this pandemic um, challenging to control. One would be how fast you can spread and how long you're infectious. And two, the fact that your peak infectiousness occurs before your symptoms. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is the fact is to ask, does every person that gets infected, do they go on to infect two and a half other people? And the answer to that is of course, no, uh, there's variability, but I wanna really show you real data and impress on you the amount of variability and how large it is. And that ends up being really um, pretty amazing. So it turns out that for both this virus and all the diseases we've ever studied, there's a huge amount of variability between people in how many cases each case gives rise to. And for COVID-19, for SARS-CoV-2, the pattern is really strong. And that is that the majority of people, let me say this super clearly, more than half of all people that get infected with this virus will go on to infect no one, which is amazing. So half of people don't infect anyone, but the virus still keeps going. How is that? And that's because the remaining people go on to infect one other person or lots of other people. And so this um, drawing here, this graph on the right-hand side is a drawing of an outbreak in Austria. Each circle is a person and the x-axis is time. And the circles that are in any cone of red color, those are people that went on to infect other people connected by lines. So this person here infected three people, those three circles. Of those three people, these two infected no one. This person did infect other people. In fact, this person infected 10 other people. 
That's shown by all these uh, lines here. But of those people, the blue ones, they don't go on to infect anyone. So in this outbreak here, that was a total of 57 cases, 41 people, which are all the blue circles, infected no one. So there are 60, 57 people infected, 41 people didn't infect any other people, but the remaining 16 people infected some other people. And in fact, some people, two people actually infected 10 other people. So this pattern that actually occurs in for both this virus and actually for, for everything we've ever studied is that a subset of people are disproportionately responsible for infecting other people, whereas most people, the, the majority in this case, infect none. And that's really important to keep in mind because it means we should ask if we wanna stop this virus from spreading, what we really need to focus on are those people and events that lead to these big spreading events. So the question of course is what causes these spreading events? It turns out we now know it's a combination of three things. One is there's variation among people in how infectious you are, how much virus you spread out when you talk or breathe or sneeze, those kinds of things. It's also important how susceptible the people around you are. It's also important how, uh, how many people you contact, so how social you are, or what kind of an event you're at. Are you by yourself in your house with no one else? Of course, you're not gonna infect anyone. Are you in a, say, a large bar talking loudly? You might infect 10 people. Next, we have, now have good data that, that shows that the activity of the person that's infected plays an important role. And we know that things like singing, talking, yelling, and exercising, where we basically uh, yeah, expel, expel more droplets out of our mouth, that increases the risk of transmission. And then we also now know that certain settings make transmission much more likely. So enclosed air spaces, as I mentioned before, are quite important. And um, we have some evidence that the virus um, actually survives better in cooler <clears throat> and drier conditions. So cold and dry air makes the virus do better in the air. So that helps. And if we describe settings that uh, have these characteristics, you guys have probably all heard of reports of, of epidemics or outbreaks occurring in prisons, worker dormitories, meatpacking plants, some in hospitals, some in churches, some in schools, and some in elder care facilities. And these are all enclosed spaces, often where people are talking or uh, interacting in these ways. And so what we now know is that super spreading events are almost always the convergence of all three of these possibilities all happening at once. And that's why we've tried to minimize the chance for this kind of stuff occurring. Okay, so the next um, aspect of this, the ecology of COVID-19 I wanna to try to touch on is how deadly is this disease or this virus? It turns out that um, for the first six months or so, there was a lot of debate and discussion about this. And that was because people were confirming, excuse me, were confusing two, two kind of ideas or concepts. One is called the case fatality rate. And the other one is called the infection fatality rate. And the confusion of these two is what caused a lot of confusion and, and discussion. So the case fatality rate is the fraction of confirmed cases that go on to die. And so you say, okay, that kind of makes some sense, except it turns out that a confirmed case is just someone that, that tests positive for the virus. So that is challenging because of course, if you have, don't have very much testing, then you won't have very many cases and that's not gonna affect how many people live or die given that they're infected, right? So changes in testing capacity shouldn't affect your characterization of how deadly a disease is. And yet by this definition, it does. So this definition, this case fatality ratio is a really hard number to interpret because it can be affected by just what your testing capacity is and who you choose to test. In contrast, what you really wanna know is the infection fatality rate, which is the fraction of all infected people that go on to die. So that's, that's actually exactly, I think the concept that we all want in our head, which is great. And we know we have some data, which I'm gonna show you in a second, that this varies with characteristics of people, age, um, other kind of health conditions and things like that. We can calculate this number for whole populations, um, and especially if we have the age of the people. So the challenging part is that the news often reports the case fatality rate, when in fact we want the, the infection fatality rate. And the reason why that happens and why that was so confusing for people is because it's actually quite easy to just count all the cases, count the deaths, and divide deaths by cases, and you've got yourself the CFR, the case fatality rate. But of course, we just hopefully now understand that that's not a great way of measuring the deadliness of something. In contrast, to get the IFR, the infection fatality rate, you have to count the deaths and then count all of the infections, including the ones that people have no symptoms at all, that are totally asymptomatic. So that turns out to be much, much harder. And that's why we didn't actually have good estimates of this IFR, the chance of dying, um, until a few months into the epidemic. The ways that we measure this are twofold, either 
We actually screen people for evidence of past exposure to find all infections. So that's done with a kind of blood test or serological tests, or in a few rare circumstances, we actually test everyone in a population like frequently to find all the infections. And that's actually been done just one time, actually a couple times. Um, and one of them that people will have heard of is that there was a cruise ship stuck off the coast of Japan and they actually tested everyone on board and we could find all the infections that way. So that was the way we could get all the infections and get all the deaths and we could actually measure this. So, um, so these are the concepts I wanna to try to get across. And now I wanna show you the actual data. So the chance of you dying, given that you get infected from COVID-19 with, excuse me, with this virus is shown on this graph. The x-axis is age, and the y-axis is your chance of dying on a log scale in percent. So this is 10%, 1%, 0.1%, 0.01%, and 0.001%. And I'm now showing you data from the best studies we have globally, which include a, a sero survey, this kind of blood test study in New York City, um, data from China, data from England, data from France, data from Geneva, and data from Spain. And so what you can hopefully see with your eye is that as you get older, your chance of dying goes up and it doesn't just go up a little bit, your chance of dying goes up a lot. And in fact, if you kind of put a line, kind of estimate the best fit through all of this data, your chance of dying goes up tenfold for every 20 years of age. So if you're 85 years old, the chance that you'll die given that you get infected with this virus across kind of all um, uh, men and women and then different age, excuse me, uh, health conditions is about 10%. If you're 65, so 20 years younger, your chance is 1%. If you're 45, it's 0.1% and so on. So this has played a huge role in the vaccination allocation um, prioritization schemes, because as you can see, the, the chance of death is not just a little bit higher for older people, but really, really enormous amounts higher. And that's why <clears throat> most states are now targeting people either 75 or older or 65 or older and so on. I will note that if I put the same data for the flu on this graph, it would be about tenfold lower than all these ones. So a whole kind of one unit down lower than that. So this virus, SARS-CoV-2 is about 10 times as deadly as the flu for any given age category. Okay, um, so the next little piece that I wanna tell us about in terms of the ecology um, is uh, factors that affect the overall intensity of an epidemic. And these kind of can be grouped in, in a couple things. The first are things, what makes the virus more likely to be spread among people? And that has partly to do with how susceptible or infectious people are. Um, there's a little bit of data that I won't go into detail, but people can ask me at the end if they're interested, that suggests that children are slightly less susceptible to infection and have slightly lower infectiousness than people that are older. And that pattern seems to be a little bit stronger for people less than 10 years of, old, of age than adults. Although, even though they're a little bit less susceptible and less, infect, excuse me, less infectious, they're not, not susceptible and they're not completely not infectious. So they can get infected and they can spread the virus, but it appears the data suggests that they're a little bit less infectious and less susceptible. Um, next big part that plays a role is, is if there's higher contact rates among people, then that can also obviously increase transmission. And so a huge question is, are people that live in dense cities, does transmission higher in cities than they are in kind of more sparse rural populations? There's now been a bunch of studies on this and I've just shown a couple graphs here just to show you a hint of the raw data. And it shows two things. One is that as you increase density on the x-axis in both of these graphs, the number of COVID cases does go up. So there is a relationship where larger kind of more dense um, populations have higher numbers of cases. And this has been seen in both the UK, which is up here, US counties down here, there's some other studies as well. So there is a pattern, but there's also a bunch of noise around it. So, so the amount of variation around this relationship is quite high, which means you can be in a city that doesn't have a huge amount of cases, which would be basically up over here on the right with kind of a low number of cases, or you can be in a rural area that actually has relatively high numbers of cases. And that's seen in both kind of sets of data. So there is a relationship with density, but it's not uh, perfect so that there's still risk across all areas. Okay. Um, and finally, um, as I said a minute ago, populations that um, are older have a higher chance of dying given infection. And that means that older populations have a much higher, much kind of more intense epidemic in terms of overall deaths. Okay, um, the next part of the ecology of, of this disease that I wanted just to um, have us reflect on a little bit is the seasonality of it. And so there's huge amounts of seasonality for other respiratory pathogens, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, and so things like the common cold, the flu, there's lots of seasonality in mosquito-borne diseases, tick-borne diseases, and so on. And I've shown you in the upper right-hand graph up here, how sh sharp 
the seasonality is for these for one other virus, but there's data for other things that look similar. So the x-axis on each of these little graphs is time. That's the week of the year from January to December. And the y-axis is the incidence of those diseases. And what you can hopefully see with your eyes super clearly is that no matter where you are in the US, the south, the northeast, the west, or the Midwest, there's way more cold. This is for a common cold virus. There's way more common cold viruses in the winter time than there are in the summertime. So that's, I'm not telling you anything you didn't already know, but I'm showing you hard data on that. What I wanna do is contrast that with the data we have so far for COVID-19, which is what I've shown on the bottom graph here. The x-axis is again time from April when we first, March and April when we first started detecting the virus until now, January. And you can hopefully see that while there is a little bit of seasonality there, it looks like some places it was higher in the spring and then went down in the summer and then went back up in the fall. Some things don't seem to show that pattern at all. Some places seem to have went up and they actually had a peak in the summer and then fell in the fall and then went back up in the, in the winter time. Whereas other places like this pink one, which is Wisconsin, they were, had a little bump in the summer, a big bump in the fall, and now have actually gone back down. So the reason I show you this is because um, uh, early in this epidemic, although there is some seasonality, we think that actually in the future, there will be a stronger seasonal pattern like we see with cold and the common cold and the flu, Right now, what's more important than that is uh, intervention behaviors, so things like uh, shelters in place and restrictions like that, and kind of human behavior. And that's playing a much more dominant role than things that affect um, uh, the, seasonal, the seasonal kind of ecological factors. However, I will point out that we think that studies that have been done on other diseases where we have multiple years of data suggest that seasonality can be driven both by host physiology, so whether you're more susceptible to infection at different times of the year due to, say, day length or or um, kind of hormones and things like that. There's some evidence for that, although it appears to be relatively weak, but there's very strong data showing that people change their behavior and in many settings spend more time indoors during the winter. So that means obviously if you spend more time indoors and the risk of transmission is higher indoors, then you'll have a higher chance for transmission. In addition, as I mentioned briefly before, there's good data now showing that both for SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses like this, their survival outside the host in the air is higher if it's uh, drier and colder. And so um, these three things all together drive the seasonality of a disease. And although we have little hints of seasonality so far for SARS-CoV-2, and people do think that this rise in cases in the fall and winter is partly due to um, uh, seasonality and partly due to uh, changes in people's behavior going indoors, the dominant patterns are also influenced by these other factors I mentioned. Okay, um, so the last part of today is to ask, how are we going to get into this future where seasonality becomes more important? Um, you know, tell us something about the vaccines that are out there. So, um, so I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the vaccines. And so there actually are more than 100 vaccines in various stages of development, which is a crazy number. But today I'm going to primarily focus on two that the U.S. has actually already authorized for people to actually get shots. And so those are the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, which I'm sure you guys have all heard of already. Just to bring you up to speed. Both of them are based on um, this technology where they actually have a little piece of RNA, um, which, which is a, a molecule that our cells normally use to make proteins. And both of these vaccines are pieces of RNA surrounded by a little bit of um, lipids, so little kind of fats around them. And uh, when we get injected with these vaccines, these little particles fuse with our cells, and then our cells see that little piece of RNA, and we actually make proteins from that RNA. And the RNA that are in these vaccines um, are basically RNA that make, that code for the spike protein on the surface of the virus, but just that little piece of it. So it's the, the RNA that we have in these vaccines don't make copies of the virus, but they make copies of a protein that's a little part of the virus, which our immune system can recognize. And so these pieces of RNA that are in the um, vaccines, um, our bodies break them down in just a couple days. So people have asked like, if I get injected with this RNA vaccine, will I have this RNA in my body for my whole life? And the answer is no. Um, our cells metabolize that RNA after just a few days. But when our body does make proteins from that RNA and those cells then present those proteins on their surfaces or if those cells get broken down and there's, those proteins are now floating around in your blood, um, our immune system sees those, uh, those proteins, those spike proteins that are the same spike protein that the virus has and says, shoot, there's some sort of invading thing. Let's make an immune response to that um, spike protein. So that involves a bunch of different kinds of cells that I won't get into the details of, but there's B cells and T cells, actually a couple different kinds of B cells and T cells, and those get activated, which then mount an immune reaction to those spike proteins. Um, and that's actually the immune response that, that the vaccines produce that protects us. 
Um, so that's just roughly a description of the vaccines, how they work, and exactly how these two kinds work that are in these um, two vaccines. I will tell you that there are other vaccines and a few at quite advanced stages that use other vaccine technologies. Um, there's a couple out there that actually use a different kind of virus with the spike protein RNA kind of plugged into that virus. Um, that's the AstraZeneca virus, excuse me, vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Um, and then there's also another vaccine in quite late state development by a company called Novavax that actually take, um, uh, they actually make the protein itself and then actually put that um, in kind of nanoparticles and actually inject those. And so I won't get into the details of those, but I wanted to just uh, tell you that those exist and those are kind of coming soon. Okay, I wanna give you a tiny bit of detail on how effective these vaccines are. And this slide is a little bit crazy, but I'm just gonna draw your attention to a couple things on it. So there's two vaccines that you guys can get shots over. Maybe actually some of you have already gotten the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine as people often refer to them. And I just wanna give you the, the careful detail on what we actually know about their efficacy and, and help you understand in a tiny bit more detail. So you both, I'm sure you've already heard that both these vaccines are about 95% effective. So this one 94.1% in this trial and this one 94.8%. The data that's actually based on is basically giving um, people either the vaccine or the placebo. And I wanted just to point out the numbers because I want you to give it a sense for how much data we actually have on these. We actually gave the vaccine to about 15,000 people for the Moderna trial and, and we gave placebo shot, so a shot that didn't have the vaccine in it, to 15,000 people also. And we simply followed them over time. And if they got symptoms, we had them come to a doctor and get tested. And if they tested positive for the virus, we call that a symptomatic case. And so the x-axis in both these graphs is the time since they got the shot. The first shot is shown by this arrow here. Their second dose was here. This is so time since they got their shots. The y-axis is whether or not they got, there was a symptomatic case in that group. And every time there was a case, the line will go up a little bit. So this kind of gray line is the placebo group and the blue line is the vaccinated group. And what you can hopefully see is that just after the first shot, the two lines are on top of each other. There was no effect of the vaccine at all. Somewhere around here between days kind of 10 and 20, and I'll talk more about that in a second, the lines start to separate and the new symptomatic cases start to occur much more frequently in the placebo group and it rises faster than the cases we see in the vaccination group. So I wanna say a couple things. One is, is that there's a huge difference between these two lines. So the vaccine helps a ton. In fact, it reduces your chance of symptomatic illness by about 94% here or 95%. So that's fantastic, but it's not 100%. So there were some symptomatic cases in the vaccinated group here. And that's because this blue line here is not at zero the entire time. So that's, that's I wanted to give you guys kind of the details of how that worked. I will tell you that the number of cases in these trials, even though there's thousands and thousands of people in them, about 30,000 total in this trial and 40,000 in this trial, the number of total cases is not that high in the trial itself. So in fact, this difference here is based on about 200 cases where about 190 cases occurred in the placebo group and just 10 cases in the um, vaccinated group. And the same is true for the Pfizer trial. So both the trials had huge numbers of people in them, but only a small fraction of people got infected, which is good because we don't want everyone infected. But the, the split or the, the fraction of all cases that were in the placebo group versus the vaccination group was so disparate 190 to 10, that's how we can assess this and say, hey, the placebo, those people are getting symptomatic disease at a much, much higher rate than those that are vaccinated. So that's the details there. The last part of, about this that I want to tell you about that I think maybe you might've seen a news report or two, but I wanna give you the slightly more detail is that the efficacy has um, been shown to be uh, quite similar across age groups and ethnicities, which is great. And not shown on these graphs, but also in the data is that the vaccines appear to be quite effective, not just at any sort of symptomatic cases, including mild cases, but also severe cases. And that's actually the reason we have the vaccines in the first place. So, um, so uh, the, in, the in the Moderna trial, there were 30 severe disease cases in the placebo group and zero in the vaccinated group. So that's about as good as it can get, right? We basically had no severe cases in the vaccinated group, which is fantastic. The Pfizer trial did not have enough severe cases to really assess the difference, but we think it probably would be similar. The last part I wanna say about the vaccines that you may have heard about, but I wanna show you the raw data, is that both vaccines appear to give some protection that starts around 10 to 12 days after the first shot. So on the, X, on the graph over here is time since the first shot, the y-axis is again cases, and what you can see is that the vaccine and the placebo group are basically on top of each other for the first 10 days, and then the placebo group starts getting more and more cases, where the vaccine group starts getting some cases, but at a much slower rate, and this is based on tens of thousands of people. And as you can see, these two lines diverge 
somewhere around days 10 to 12. So that's caused a bunch of people to say, hey, is one dose just good enough? And if so, can't we actually get twice as many people vaccinated by giving everyone one shot instead of giving everybody two shots? So there's been a giant discussion amongst scientists and various people um, uh, to try to ask this question for obvious reasons, because we could vaccinate twice as many people. However, and that's the big but right here, is that it's not clear how well this protection would last or how, the, how strong this protection would be if people didn't get their next dose three to four weeks later. So all these, so th this looks great for this first three or four weeks after that, but we don't have a whole set of people that got their first dose and then didn't get their second dose three or four weeks later. And because of that, we don't know how good that protection would last. And so, um, so that's made people say that do, using a single dose is probably not a good idea. We don't know if that would actually, your immunity would just fade after a while and it would not be effective anymore. However, because of the urgency to get more vaccines to people, if we just increase that delay a little bit from the three to four weeks that was used in the trial to a little bit longer, we can get more vaccines to more people, at least initially. And so the CDC is actually now has a policy that you're supposed to use four, three to four weeks between shots. But if you delay it a little bit longer and have six weeks under, under crazy circumstances, that's okay too. And the UK has taken an even further step and they've said, you know what? We think that that immunity is gonna last a little while we're actually gonna have the delay between the first and second doses be up to 12 weeks. And so I'll just tell you that for the Pfizer vaccine that they're using this for, there's no data to support that, but they're seeing the urgency of vaccinating people, uh, twice as many people and having this longer delay. They're saying the risk benefit of that is, is a, a strategy they want to try to take. And people are worried about it for a number of reasons, um, but I wanna just kind of give you the underlying data underlying that discussion. The last thing I'll just say is that there's some talk about whether we can actually give people half of a dose instead of a full dose in terms of the amount. And that would give us um, um, twice as many doses as we could give to people. That's being looked at as well. So that's the detail on, um, on the vaccines. And I think the last part I wanted to talk about, oh yeah, so the safety quickly. And then the last part is on the kind of new viral variants that are out there. So, um, so the safety of these two vaccines has been shown to be quite good. You, there is um, a substantial fraction of people will have some mild side effects. Um, so things like a headache, pain at the injection site, that kind of stuff, but they're much, much, much milder than the disease itself. And so I would strongly recommend anyone that has a chance to get one of these vaccines, absolutely to get one. Okay, um, so the last part I want to talk about just for a couple minutes is the evolution of the virus um, and how this might change the pandemic itself. So I'll just say a couple general things and then we'll talk about the specific variants that have been talked about so far. So briefly, pathogens have one goal, which is to replicate. And it's not really a goal, but that's how evolution kind of works. In making more copies of themselves, there are errors or mutations in, in pathogens in general. I will say that most mutations that happen in, in this virus and other pathogens have no effect at all or actually are actually bad for the pathogen. Um, but a small subset of mutations actually result in the pathogens evolving to become either more infectious, more deadly, um, or to actually infect people that already have immunity or been previously exposed. And we'll talk about those possibilities next. So, um, so let me just say that the, the deadliness part, which is host, uh, the kind of host pathogen interaction, I wanna say a couple things about that, um, that the damage that the, the pathogens make to the hosts are, um, is basically an accidental byproduct of replication. So the, the pathogen, the virus just wants to make more copies, but when it does so, it often uses our cells to do so. So we get some damage that occurs from that, but the pathogen isn't trying to kill us. But unfortunately, because if there's more pathogen there, the chance of infection is higher, that sometimes results in selection on the virus to become more virulent. Um, and so, so I just wanted to get that part clear and say additionally to that, some pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2, sometimes uh, infect cells that don't actually help them replicate or get to the next host at all that still hurt us. So SARS-CoV-2 actually infects lots of different tissues, including things in your heart and there's no transmission from one person's heart to the next. It gets there via us breathing. So that doesn't help the pathogen, but it still actually hurts people. So some of the, uh, the disease that we see is actually kind of an accidental byproduct of the pathogen just trying to replicate as much as it can um, in the lungs and it gets to other tissues as well. Okay, um, I think we're getting close to running out of time. So I think I'm gonna skip through a couple slides that I had um, and just uh, jump here to say that the virus is evolving a bunch and um, and let me just talk about the variants that we have out there right now. So there are, um, yeah, I'll just step through them. So there are a bunch of different versions of this virus out there now. There's actually, the virus is mutating all the time. Most of the mutations make no difference at all, but some mutations actually appear to have functional effects on the virus. 
So the first one that you guys may have heard of if you're following the news was this mutation early on called the D614G mutation. And that was uh, not seen in the early viruses back in January and February last year, first popped up or first was detected in March, and then became globally dom dominant in the next few months. And we have quite a bit of evidence from that from a bunch of different kinds of studies that suggest it does slightly increase transmission. Sorry, let me uh, just mute people for one last couple minutes here. Um, okay, so, um, so that's that mutation. That one's been around for a while. Almost all the viruses in the whole world now have this mutation. So now we have a couple new variants, new variants. So there's a variant that was first detected in the UK, and you'll see it called a bunch of things because there's not really good ways of naming things just yet, but the other, one of the names you'll see is this B117 for it. This variant has a bunch of changes to the spike protein, that part of the, of the virus that it uses to, it, to uh, infect our cells. And we now have pretty good data suggesting that this virus variant is about 30 to 50% more transmissible, and recent data from last week suggesting it might be a little bit more deadly. And unfortunately, this virus variant has now been found throughout uh, many, many countries in the world and definitely throughout the US. In fact, it's been found in more than half of all the states, including California. So this variant is definitely here. It's still at a relatively low frequency, but because it's slightly more transmissible than the previous than the other strains, most people think that it's going to rise to become the dominant strain in just the next month or two. And that's obviously not good. Um, another variant that's out there is a variant that was first detected in South Africa. This also has many different changes in its spike protein. Um, and we think that those changes in the spike protein have made it, well, not we think, we actually know, that's made it able to evade some of our antibodies. So um, in laboratory experiments, people have shown that this, these kinds of viruses, these, vir these variants here, they, uh, the antibodies that we make from previous exposure or from vaccination don't bind as well to this virus. They basically don't neutralize it as well as um, the, the other, the original kind of virus that was out there. However, and I wanna make this super, super clear, um, it doesn't, uh, there's, our immune system has many different ways of attacking the virus, and um, this variant, our, our bodies still can mount immune responses to it, and in fact, some people still mount plenty good antibody responses to it, and we have other arms of our immune system, like T cells, that all scientists that have been working on this believe that if we got infected with this variant, um, we would still get, and we were either previously exposed or vaccinated, we would have a much, much lower chance of, of getting um, any sort of disease and even severe disease. So this variant is worrisome, but, um, but we, uh, the vaccines definitely are still um, quite effective, uh, provide quite effective immunity to this variant. Uh, let's see. And then the last one is this variant that we actually know not that much about so far, but there's a variant in Brazil, first detected in Brazil, that again has a bunch of changes to its spike protein, including a few that are the same changes as we saw in the South Africa variant, that again, we think, um, well, yeah, it's been shown to have, uh, basically our immune system doesn't react as well to it, um, but we don't quite know the full details of exactly whether it's more transmissible or not, um, whether it has any sort of changes in, in the, the severity of disease. You will have seen news reports about other variants popping up. There's another one in California that's been detected and talked about a bit, but we just don't have enough data now to understand whether these variants have functional, are functionally better viruses or have different functional traits, or they've just spread through populations by chance. And I will tell you that there are, uh, it's difficult to disentangle those two without a bunch of um, important data that we don't have for these other variants yet. Um, and I think, I think that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I had one more puzzle, but I'll skip that and give you guys that for a take home exercise. So with that, I think we're pretty much out of time, Jim. Um, uh, I think if there's some quick questions, we probably can take them, but I think we're close to out of time, right, Jim? Yes, we are, Marm, and I'm gonna save you from that. I mean, I think if I don't, you're gonna be on all afternoon because this is obviously something that people have lots of interest in. So uh, what I would say to those of you that have questions, Marm has very kindly um, offered to, to answer your questions. Uh, ju just be humane about it, please. He's a busy guy. And so, um, you know, to, if, if it's something that's really important to you, go ahead. I think it's okay with him, but uh, you know, be 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 mindful of that if you would, please. And um, <clears throat> and and as Barry had mentioned, the the lecture has been recorded. So and there's a lot of resource, lots of resources there in the way of information for those of you that really want to dig into this more. So go back and look at that. So I just want to end this by by thanking you, Marm. It was a fabulous lecture, as I knew it would be. Uh, not only a great scientist, but a really good citizen in, in your willingness to, you know, to jump into society and work on this and help us locally. We're very, very fortunate to have you here. Um, 
I want to thank all of you for uh, the class. I hope you enjoyed it. I mean, we had four really wonderful speakers and um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to have been able to, to facilitate that. Uh, again, hope you, hope you enjoyed the class. Uh, let's thank Marm. We can't do it in real, real life, but uh, you know, some sort of a virtual clap would be probably very much called for here. Uh, and so with that, we'll bring the class to a close and maybe I'll see you again one of these 